All right, hello, College Biology. Mrs. Erickson here, talking about coelomates, part one. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about three phylums, the mollusks, the annelids, and the lophophorites. Um, and again, raven, this would be mostly, it's still chapter 34, actually, but the sections are off. So as we go through, I'll tell you which page numbers to primarily focus on. But remember, um, with our non coelomates which are basically the acelomates and pseudocelomates, you know, they were successful, but there is a third way our animal body also evolved, and that was like the full-on body cavity called the coelom. And it allowed to it allowed that those organisms with the coelom to increase in body size, um, as well as develop some complex tissues and organ systems, and to kind of branch out into a wide variety of different body plan structures that we're going to cover here today. And so I'm going to cover the mollusks and the annelids as well as um, the local porate. Um, and then part two will be the uh, arthropods and the echinoderms. Okay, so mollusks, clams, snails, slugs, um, octopi or octop octopuses, annelids are going to be earthworms, leeches, sea worms. Uh, their primary characteristic is segmentation. Um, and then the lophophorites are, uh, mo actually, I think all of them are marine, and uh, they're kind of cool to look at too. So first up, phylum mollus mollusca or the mollusks. Very diverse, second to arthropods, um, lots of different species, but they have a, a coelom surrounding the heart. They can be really small, they can be huge, but they are a very important food source for humans um, in that, you know, we can eat them, right? Okay, but they can also be pests, especially in Minnesota with the zebra mussels. So just to show you a picture of some of the many mollusks, um, so class gastropods are usually your snails. The bivalves are clams, anything with two shells. We'll talk about the chitin. Um, we'll talk about squid, okay? So different types of cephalopods. And I don't know if we'll talk about this dude at all. But anyways, basic body plan is that most of them um, are bilaterally symmetrical except gastropods. Gastropods are snails. Um, and they lost their symmetry due to torsion. And so I'll talk a little bit about that when I get to the segment on gastropods. Uh, the coelom is reduced. It is limited to small paces, places uh, throughout the organism, especially the exc excretory organs, the heart, and part of the intestine. Now, the internal organs um, that you should really focus on are, are the ones kind of in the visceral mass. You'll find your digestive, excretory, and reproductive organs there. Um, they also have a muscular foot, which is their primary means for locomotion. Now, in cephalopods, their foot has been divided um, into tentacles or arms, okay? Because squid, actually, they um, don't have ten they have two tentacles and the rest are arms. Um, octopi, I believe all of them are tentacles, and the nautilus can have several. But anyways, their muscular foot has been divided into tentacles or arms where it's used for locomotion as well as attachment or food capture. Now gastropods, uh, they secrete a mucus to slide and then their foot kind of um, pushes off of that and uh, they, yeah, that's, that's actually how they move on land. Now, um, focusing on the mantle, all of them have mantles, okay? It's a very thick epidermal sheet of skin covering the dorsal side of the body in some form. A lot of times it houses circulatory organs, um, especially the tinnidia. And then there's also openings for excretory, reproductive, and digestive um, organs as well. Now, tendidia is kind of like how it um, exchanges or how it gets oxygen into it and um, waste products out. But it's a system of filamentous projections, very rich in blood vessels. And because of, of the very fine filaments um, that we see, it increases surface area for gas exchange. And it is extremely uh, efficient at what it does. Okay, shells. Um, most mollusks have shells, but not all of them, okay? So, like, the ones that don't have shells, you know, just think about mostly your cephalopods. Um, but the primary function for cells is protection, okay? Because a lot of times these organisms will withdraw into that shell. And the basic anatomy is calcium carbonate produced in some type of layers and um, another protein mixed in with it called conchin. How do mollusks feed and capture prey? Uh, using something called a radula, a very rasping-like tongue-like organ, um, and it's made of microscopic chitinous teeth arranged in rows. This is a good picture of that. 
Um, if it's a Bethnic creature, it will scrape algae, gastropods, literally drill holes through the shells of prey. Some have harpoons with venom, but you do not see the radula in bivalves, which are clams. Okay. Clams filter feed. Um, how do, does it remove waste? The nephridia is mostly their excretory structure that kind of gets rid of nitrogenous waste. So nephridia starts with N, nit nitrogenous N. Um, but it also has a nephrostome, which is kind of like a, a funnel that runs to their bladder. And so here is the nephridium right here. And I'm not seeing the nephrostome, but it's this structure right here. Okay, they do have a circulatory system. Okay, um, remember our, our body cavity is greatly reduced around um, a lot of organ systems, so they usually have some type of open circulatory space. Um, open circulatory system of all mollusks except for the cephalopods. Cephalopods have a closed circulatory system. Uh, their heart has three chambers. Okay, cephalopods have a closed circulatory system, which means that their blood does not enter in contact with tissues, it doesn't pool in a certain area, um, so yeah. Mollusk reproduction, they, there are distinct male and female individuals, but there are a few species out there that are hermaphroditic. They engage in external fertilization, which means they release gametes in water and mix. Gastropods, however, have internal fertilization, which is a key adaptation to prevent from drying out because they live in moist areas on land. Now the four classes of mollusks, there's actually eight, but I'm just going to focus on four. Um, the, the chitons, the gastropods, bivalves, and the cephalopods. Okay, so I color-coded the heading um, for each one. So polyplacophora, the, the chitons here, oval bodies, eight overlapping dorsal plates. Um, under the plates, the body is not segmented, and it just kind of creeps along as it moves. They are graze and herbivores, live in shallow marine habitats. That's all I gotta say about them. Moving on to the gastropods, snails and slugs. Okay, primarily marine, but there are some freshwater terrestrial ones out there. Most have a shell, okay? Slugs and sea slugs have lost their shells. And then they creep along on that foot and um, their head has a pair of tentacles with eyes at the base. Um, it's They have chemo or mechanical Canal recept sorry, sensors um, to, to aid it in finding food. So. All right, now remember, gastropods are not bilateral. Um, so the reason why they are not bilateral is because of torsion due to their embryonic development. Uh, basically, their mantle, cavity, and anus is moved from the posterior location to the front. So that go back. Here's the mouth, and you notice that um, up here, it's like it's moved upward. This, I wish, I think I have a better picture coming up. Um, not only that, the shell with coiling um, kind of messes up the bilateral symmetry too, but the main reason is torsion. Okay, well, I guess I don't. It's just that it's, it's up more, so it's not bilateral. Bivalves. Most of them are marine. There are some freshwater out there. They have two shells, left and right. They hinge dorsally. Um, if we were going to do clam, clam dissections, getting cutting through the muscle um, that holds the shells together can be pretty tough. But uh, they, how remember, they don't have a radula. Okay, so how they um, eat is filter feed. So they have siphons that act like snorkels. Um, yeah, they filter water through the body when they are buried in the, the, the sand. Their gills have filaments with blood vessels. Uh, they're filter feeders, no distinct heads or radulas, and a wedge-shaped foot to help it burrow in the, in, in the ground. So there's the foot, okay. Siphons right here and here. So it's incurrent, nope, never mind. Incurrent's here. So then it filters through the entire body, and the extra current is where it comes out. Cephalopods live entirely in oceans. They are extremely active predators and pretty smart, too. 
Um, but their foot has evolved into a series of arms that have suction cups, adhesive structures, or hooks. Squids have 10, octopi have 8, and the nautilus has between 80 and 90. Um, they can snare their prey with their tentacles, and then they bring it up to their beak-like paired jaws. Very highly developed nervous system. Their eyes are extremely elaborate. They, they can... Um, they just have really good eyesight. And then not only that, they do exhibit complex patterns of behavior. Um, they are, like I said before, extremely intelligent. And actually, some of the um, octopi or octopus, they actually are, they can camouflage themselves. So they can actually change the texture of the outside of their skin, as well as colors to blend in with their environment. So they are extremely successful in open water. And because of that, it's kind of led to the reduction of their external shell. Now, Nautilus, pictured top panel here, still have shells. Um, cuttlefish, squid, they have some rigidity, but, you know, not too much weight. They do have internal shells. Um, I believe it's the pen, the ink pen that's been reduced as their mantle. And then the octopi, no internal or external shell. So how do they move? Jet propulsion. They take water in through the mantle, expelled through the siphon. When they are threatened, they can... You know, eject water violently, shoot themselves through the water. They have some uh, have an ink sac that can release an ink cloud to confuse predators. And then, as I said before, they can actually camouflage. And these um, structures are actually called chromatophores, pigments embedded in the epithelium that can change color and texture um, to blend in. But they also believe it might be a way to um, communicate to other organisms. Okay, that's it for mollusks. Moving on to annelids. And the primary characteristic here is segmentation. Um, or repeated units found throughout the organism. Different segments may possess a different combination of different organs, um, maybe due to, you know, they carry out reproduction, feed and locomotion, respiration, excretion. Um, it's ring-like for these re repeated segments. Uh, the, they're, they're subdivided kind of by septa, okay, kind of like tiny little walls, if you will. The fluid within the coelom of the body cavity creates a hydrostatic skeleton. So they kind of use this fluid to, to move. And each segment does contain chaite, or bristles, as you can see here, uh, that help anchor worms during, during locomotion. So another picture showing, let's see, we have segmentation. Okay, so we have a septa in between each little segmentation. And then down here, the bristles that you see, the, 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 the saite or chaite, or however the heck you say it. Now the anterior, or the front, has most of your specialized organs here. They are extremely sensitive to light. Some have eyes with lens and retinas, some species I should say. Well-developed ganglion, which is considered the brain. They do have a closed circulatory system and a ventral nerve cord that connects each segment to one another to their brain, which is up here. Three main classes of annelids, polychaeta or the marine worms. Um, I guess they're feathery in, in appearance. They are filter feeders. Um, you really don't need to know much about the marine worms um, for this exam. The Alego Shaita or Chaita are the earthworms. I think you might need to associate that word with earthworms. Um, but they pretty much um, eat their way through soil, and they have a region inside of them called the gizzard that grinds up organic material. You'll see that on your earthworm dissection uh, after this exam. Material deposited forms castings, it helps enrich the soil, it loosens the soil, it, it allows air to get into the soil, it actually is really good for the soil. They do not have eyes, but they do have numerous sensitive cells to light, chemi chemicals, as well as touch. Uh, Legoshita or earthworms are hermaphroditic, um, but they can mate. Uh, the part I'd like to focus, the band-aid part, is called the clitellum, okay, and it secretes mucus to hold the earthworms together during copulation. They exchange sperm. The sperm gets stored in the sperm receptacles. And then a couple days later, the clitellum secretes a mucus cocoon protected by chitin, and fertilization takes place within that cocoon. So here we have two earthworms made in. You can see that they are lined up opposite of each other. Um, and then a tube of mucus will be secreted from the clitellum. And inside here is where fertilization has taken place. And then the young worms hatch out into the soil. So a real-life picture of the worms making egg cocoons and then hatching out of that. 
All right, the third class is are the leeches, the hyodenia, flattened dorsal ventrally, like flatworms, also hermaphroditic. They do develop a clitellum during breeding. They have cross-fertilization. Um, they cannot self-fertilize themselves. And uh, I guess one thing that leeches have that earthworms really don't is they have suckers at one end for both locomotion as well as to attach to their prey. So a sophisticated blood sucker and uh, the marks that they make from that. All right, the third phylum the, and the final one I'm going to discuss today are the lophophorites, the bryozoa, and the brachiopoda. And these organisms are characterized by a structure called the lophophore, a circular or U-shaped ridge found near the mouth, and it has basically ciliated tentacles. Um, the lophophore functions as surface of gas exchange as well as food collection. So here's what I mean by the lophophore and by the tentacles arranged in a U or circular shape. So bryozoa are the only um, colonial animals, I believe, uh, that produce a chit chitinous chamber, but I mean, they're the only colonial is what I meant. Um, so they live in small colonies. They look like moss animals. And if you remember from plants, um, the bryophytes means moss, so moss animals, bryozoa, zoa is animals. The digestive system is U-shaped, uh, anus opening near the mouth. So there's the anus, here's the mouth, there's the gut. Um, but yeah, I think bryozoa, you just need to, I think you need to know that they are colonial. Um, they do communicate through their pores. They develop as deuterostomes. Okay. Cleavage is radial, asexual reproduction through budding. Labrachiopodia are our solitary lophophorites. Some examples, lamp shells, basically the kind of like two little clams, calcified shells here. The valves are dorsal and ventral. They're not lateral shells like bivalves. So these are like top, bottom. Um, with the bivalves, it was left, right. Okay. They attach to a substrate by a stock. So, you know, if it doesn't have a stock, then it'll be cemented to it. The gut is U-shaped. They are protostomes with radial cleavage. So that's what they look like. There's that stock. And that does it for um, coelomates, part one.